Uh, so it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Arlene Liberté, who is in transition, actually, from one university to another. Many people here seem to, they pass through Montreal on their way from one university to another. So Ar Arlene is doing that as well. And she'll be at uh, the University of Quebec at Abitibi uh, Timiskaming. Uh, and uh, she also is a, I was going to say veteran, that doesn't sound right either, but has been, yeah, too young to be a veteran, but has been involved for many years actually uh, in, in various incarnations of our network and various projects and then uh, was able to do her postdoc in uh, Australia and we're very delighted she's back with us today. Hi everyone, thank you for being here. Uh, I will talk to you briefly about a photo voice project uh, that is currently underway. I'm presenting very, very preliminary results. There are actually more um, the pictures basically uh, and sort of our ideas of the analysis and what will come. Uh, so it's called Gaining Understanding of Well-Being and Building Capacity, Listening to the Voices of Aboriginal Youth. And this project is also done with uh, Georgia Rakis, who is at Université du Québec à Trois-Fia. And so uh, I will talk a little bit, uh, very, very briefly about the background, uh, the objectives of the study, the methodology, and uh, like I said, the very preliminary results, and hopefully we'll have time a little bit for the discussion. And so as you all know, um, Indigenous people have experienced severe and systematic disempowerment with devastating health and social impacts, and uh, these translate into psychosocial health problems as evidenced by the uh, overrepresentation of uh, many Aboriginal groups and community members in uh, long-stay settings such as um, adult in, uh, in service inpatient service, sorry, for mental health care, uh, prison, custody, forensic units, uh, rehabilitation programs, as well as a sort of revolving door phenomenon between all of these um, different care settings uh, and the community, which often serves <coughs> to um, heighten the distress within the community because there's basically unwell people coming and going and disrupting um, their like everyday lives of their families and uh, other community members. Uh, that sounds really bad to say it like that. I'm sorry if I'm not uh, expressing myself properly, but you know what I mean. Um, also, uh, this project is done with uh, the youth, and as we know, um, adolescence is a, could be a very tumultuous uh, transitional phase where there are very important developmental tasks, uh, such as figuring out your role expectation, uh, dealing with uh, body image issues, uh, resisting peer pressure, forging um, relationships, finding out about relationships, uh, meaningful relationships, ah, falling in love, it uh, could do your head in. Um, um, discussions about uh, are deciding about if we are to become sexually active, negotiating safe sex, using alcohol or not, using drugs, uh, staying in school, uh, future academic paths, uh, etc. Oh, whoops, sorry about that. And for Aboriginal adolescents and. On top of all of these uh, very important developmental tasks, uh, there's also um, the issue of your cultural identity, uh, negotiating your family ties, finding your belonging, and also coping with uh, the stressors that are present in uh, your community and in your family sometimes. And so we sought to um, look at the positive aspects, look at the strengths. Uh, both Georgia and I have studied suicide and uh, suicide prevention in our um, doctorates, and so we wanted for our postdocs and the rest of, maybe not the whole rest of our career, but at least a huge portion of, portion of it to look more at the strengths and uh, support those strengths within uh, communities. And so this project that was funded by uh, CRSH, um, what is it in English? Social Humanities Canada thing there. Really cool. We were happy to get that grant. Um, uh, we wanted to look at and understand Aboriginal youth's conception of well-being. So really, what is well-being but from the youth's perspective themselves? Uh, also analyze the larger context in which their well-being is developed, fostered, and or hindered, and gain new knowledge on youth empowerment and leadership by testing, adapting, and evaluating an Australian Aboriginal empowerment and leadership program uh, called Family Well-Being uh, within a Canadian Aboriginal context. Um, I'm going to talk about that today except to say that I was very privileged to work with that program uh, in Australia, and I actually brought it back in my little valise when I came back, and I had their permission to work with uh, our communities here, and so hopefully we'll be um, looking at different projects around uh, empowerment and using family well-being as a 
as a platform. Uh, so today I will be only talking about the aspect of the photo voice project, so understanding Aboriginal youth concept of well-being. Uh, so just very quickly, um, the description of empowerment that guided this study was really three-pronged. And so the value orientation or the philosophy that, or sort of the, the stance that we took as researchers was um, values-based uh, to, um, to create safe spaces in order for the objective of empowerment uh, to happen for the, the participants of the study. And we all know that um, empowerment is a process and you cannot have the objective of empowerment without going through the different steps and going through the process. And so that is what we use to basically describe um, empowerment and which is basically marginalized and oppressed groups um, gaining power to uh, live a better life, to have, um, to make better decisions over their, for their own self and their family, and it's not necessarily um, power over others in terms of control. I will not go into the whole Foucaultian uh, discussion because I do not master that, but um, that's basically where we're coming from. Uh, so the methodology, it is a community-based participatory research framework, and uh, which means that there is active participation and partnership with uh, between the researchers and the community. So we really see uh, researchers in this case as facilitators, and um, we share the power, we share the knowledge as well. So we come in with different sets of knowledge that we put together to hopefully um, have an interesting outcome. Uh, like I said, empowerment is a process where individuals, organizations, and communities aim to increase control over their lives and situations and also uh, build capacity in terms of just, uh, for example, negotiating the uh, collaborative research agreement. There was a lot of the um, band, band council members that learned more about research, that learned more about uh, empowerment, and so that was one sort of secondary benefit, I guess, of doing this type of research as well. And like I said, uh, we use photo voice as a data collection tool. And uh, photo voice is uh, described as a research strategy that uses photography as a tool for social change. Uh, it's a process that gives people the opportunity to record, reflect, and critique personal and community issues in a creative way. And uh, the main goals of uh, photo voice within a community-based participatory research are to help individuals and they are uh, the people who usually have uh, less power and who normally don't have a voice or feel they don't have a voice uh, to help them identify and reflect on community issues through uh, picture taking, <coughs> promote group dialogue on these issues by discussing the pictures they have taken and influence uh, decision and policy makers, so those who usually have the power in the community. And uh, so photography is not a neutral action within the, uh, within in the community-based participatory research, so it is uh, a charged medium. And uh, photo voice can help uh, people develop power, so like I was saying, the ability to accomplish things, power with, um, the, the ability to work with others in order to realize common <laughs> goals, and power over, the ability to influence others and the environment to accomplish positive change. Uh, photo voice will not only serve as a data collection tool, but it will also serve as a way for youth to express their needs and their solutions to meet their needs to their communities, uh, decision makers. And just maybe a little side note, I actually have uh, a few posters from another photo voice project because uh, at the end of the, um, the process with the youth, uh, we organize an exhibit and that's part of the knowledge translation um, or the knowledge transfer uh, cycle basically so we put on an exhibit in the community and we invite uh, everyone as well as the decision makers and the youth can present their posters can talk about the process and can talk about the different issues uh, that will that arise um, arose rather during the um, the discussion workshops and so just as an example I brought a couple of uh, posters to show them off the work of our great participants. And so photo voice is a creative and visual way to help people express themselves on issues that are important to them and their community, issues they would like to work on and improve. Um, it's a research uh, method based on Paulo Freire's empowerment education theory and aimed to develop critical consciousness. And uh, this um, empowerment education theory postulates that people are not objects simply receiving programs and projects designed 
by others for them, and it implies that individuals are active participants who get together in order to identify their own problems, uh, evaluate social and historical contexts within which these issues evolve, and develop strategies which will permit them to achieve their goals and improving their society. And so it's basically people um, coming together, uh, reflecting on what's happening in their community, and looking for ways to improve it. So it's um, doing with and instead of doing for. Uh, so like I was saying, they can develop their own tools so they can act within their community and they have the abilities and the capacities to develop them to do so. So it's a bottom-up view uh, that's based for, first and foremost on the needs identified by the community and its members and it takes into account the community's cultural practices. So because it's uh, doing with, um, there's less chance of influencing the ways of doing and being of the participants because they're in charge of the discussion, they're in charge of uh, basically the process of the research. So it's qualitative, participatory, and a visual method. It's uh, flexible, adapted to the context, the issues, and the population. And the emphasis is put on the participant's strength rather than their weaknesses or their problems. Um, Bell Hooks talks about a space of resistance, so it's basically giving people um, normally oppressed or marginalized people the opportunity to express themselves uh, on issues that are important to them and to be heard. So it's uh, basically creating a safe space in which people can resist a dominant discourse and narrative and have their own um, issues and own narrative be um, heard and be put on at the forefront. Uh, it's a mental health promotion tool, and so it's not therapy, obviously, but it can be therapeutic in the sense where um, there is a space for healing and doing. So it's healing as we go forward. It's not just sitting back and going, okay, when I heal, I'll go and do this. No, it's as we are doing this, we can regain a better sense of well-being and a better sense of who we are and a uh, better sense of identity because in, these, um, in this safe space, we're talking about uh, different aspects of well-being and necessarily within all the uh, photo voice projects that I've done, it's like three to date, um, there is the issue of culture that is prominent, the issue of cultural identity and who we are as Aboriginal people. <clears throat> um, so the impacts on the participant have been uh, evaluated in non-Indigenous youth and adults, and they were found to foster empowerment. And so for this uh, particular uh, project, the participants took pictures to express themselves. So in a workshop setting, we asked them, uh, what is well-being for you? What are the well-being problems that you are, the youth face in your community? And what can be done in order to address these problems? So even though we do talk about the problems, we can't be you know, like naive or put our head in the sand and pretend there's nothing happening in their communities. They are invited to talk about the problems, but the focus really is on the strengths and um, the definition or the description of well-being, or the meaning, rather, of well-being. And uh, so after those questions, we give the youth um, digital cameras and invite them to go and take pictures in their community, in the forest, whatever place that they think uh, they'll find representations of well-being. And in this uh, particular setting, um, there was a research agreement with the community and the tribal council. Um, the youth participants were aged from 14 to 17, and they were in a group home setting. So they were uh, kids that were placed in, um, they were under like some uh, genus, like DPG, so child care, youth protection, thank you. And um, so they were not, able to live in foster home because of their probably more acting out problems or difficulties in their uh, behavior, but they were not to a point that they needed to be internalized within the youth uh, protection programs. They were in a sort of halfway group home setting. And there are also two educators that worked for the home uh, that were trained uh, in photo voice, uh, prior to the workshops with the youth, and they assisted the youth in the picture taking, so they took them out, and it, they integrated it basically in the home's uh, activities with the youth, and so that was very facilitating for us as well. And uh, we always talk about the problems when we're doing um, 
uh, data collection in our research in First Nations communities, you know, it takes a lot of time, there's a lot of resistance, but also when I think, well, my experience has been when it's done right in the sense where the tribal council, the band council, the different community institutions are aware and um, that we do sign an agreement, it's, it can be very, very facilitating and supportive. They offer a lot of support, as seen in this example here, where the educators, uh, the, the home, uh, we had a, a space to do all the workshops, and uh, they, like the educators actually brought them out, like I said, integrated this in their daily uh, activities, so that was very helpful for this research. Uh, and so the workshops, like I said, were held at the group home and over a three-week period um, from May 28th to June 26, 2012, I think. And we're waiting. We're going to do a, another data collection for this project in one of the communities. Um, and then <coughs> hopefully around Christmas time, we'll do the exhibit with the, these pictures as well as the other communities. So that's why the data hasn't been uh, fully analyzed yet. And so these are a few of the pictures, like I said. Um, uh, so the part of the process is preparing the exhibit, and so there is the caption. We ask the youth after discussing what does well-being mean to you, uh, what are the problems, what are the solutions, we ask them to pick one or two pictures that they want to show to the whole community and what would be the essence of their message that they would want others to hear. And so um, one says, catching culture. Nature is our ancestors, our culture, our way of life. Let's stop looking at it through a window and let's live our culture. Another young girl says, before flight, a gust of wind can change everything, but change can allow us to take flight. Uh, through the wall. When facing an obstacle, sometimes a little imagination is all we need. The bridge. The bridge is my refuge. Solid and reassuring, it is where I go when I need to think. And we wouldn't think this seems like a very neutral picture, but this is a, um, one of the pictures that really prompted discussion around suicide and suicide prevention, uh, suicide contagion in the communities, the differences between what the youth felt and were experiencing versus what the parents were experiencing. So this young girl, um, this bridge was her refuge. And she thought it was so important that she took a picture of it and wanted to show it to the group and discuss it. And her mom was always worried because a number of youth from this community went to this bridge, uh, youth actually and young adults as well, and they, they, that's where they committed suicide or attempted suicide by jumping off the bridge. So for the mom, this is the suicide bridge and she doesn't want her girl to go there. So it's like this ambivalence between um, like when, you're when your kids are teenagers and you have to let give them that extra space, but at the same time, you still have that instinct to protect them. And in some of these communities, protecting your child means could mean saving their life because they could become suicidal. So there was a whole discussion uh, that arose around suicide and suicide prevention prompted by this picture. I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, solitude. Sometimes solitude and calm can be a good remedy to rise above the sadness caused by drinking and to find oneself. So we see the mix of the positives and the trying to stay positive, the trying to overcome, and the reality of in the homes of some of these kids and what they're facing. So the, 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 the problems of, say, for example, uh, drinking or um, being sad, feeling alone can come even within the message of like a positive strengths-based um, message, basically. Uh, I don't know if you can see it very well, but there are like sort of tire tracks in the grass there. And she says that no matter what you do, it will leave traces. I'd like to think I can choose what tra traces I leave. And so really just um, <coughs> briefly, um, the emerging themes that we could just kind of see from looking at the pictures and listening to, you know, very superficially to the discussion is that culture is still seen as a strength. Uh, the recognition also of individual, uh, the individual person's strength. Um, the seeing struggles as opportunities for change, staying positive in the face of difficulties, and uh, the need for safe spaces. So the, the sort of um, mental or metaphorical spaces, but also physical uh, places where we could go to if something's happening in our house, so really like in terms of refuges. And that's it.